This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Dufresne Ministries. so glad you've joined us for Jesus the Healer today. I invite you, get hold of your Bible, get a pad and get a pen and pencil and follow along with us. Become a student with those that are sitting here with us. And I tell you what, expect something while you're watching the broadcast today. Receive and release your faith in the teaching that you hear and you can receive help for your answer. We've been studying the different healings that happened under Jesus's earthly ministry. So we've, we're calling this healing school. So we welcome you to healing school today on the Jesus the Heater broadcast. Turn with us in your Bibles, if you would, to Mark chapter nine, and we're going to start reading in verse 17. Mark chapter nine and verse 17 just to set up the scene, the set here of where we're at is Jesus had just experienced what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John, he had taken to uh, the mountaintop and he had the experience of uh, having a divine visitation up there. And so Jesus comes back with Peter, James, and John off of that mountain and they return to see the multitude that's gathered around the other nine disciples. So there's 12 disciples, three of them were with Jesus, but nine of them were left down here and there's a multitude around them. And it says in Mark chapter nine, verse 17, and one of the multitude answered and said, master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. So the, the boy evidently cannot talk. And uh, verse 18, and it says, Where, uh, wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him. And he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, but they could not. Now, since Jesus wasn't present at the time of this man coming, of the multitude gathering because he, as I said, was on the top of the mountain with his other three disciples. So evidently this man had gone to the nine disciples that were there and he had, he had asked them to minister to his son and nothing happened that there was no change. So evidently they ministered to the boy and they didn't obviously get results. So listen to the words that the father said to Jesus. I spake to your disciples that they should cast him out and they could not. Look at that word, could not. Now, three chapters earlier in, in this book of Mark, uh, it records that Jesus had sent out his disciples two by two to minister. You'll remember Jesus had demonstrated how to minister to the sick. And then he takes his 12 disciples and he sends them out two by two and says, now you go. And basically you do the same thing. So Mark chapter six, we're going to look at verse seven. We're going to look at verse 12 and 13. And we're going to see what Jesus instructed his disciples to do. How many of you know we're his disciples too? Yes, so Mark chapter six, verse seven, this is our instruction also. And Jesus called unto him the 12 and began to send them forth by two and two. Look at this. And gave them power over unclean spirits. Now, let me ask you this. Do they have power yes. over unclean spirits? Yes. It says he gave them power over unclean spirits. So they do have the authority and the power to deal with the devils that they encounter. Now, look at verse 12. And they, talking about the 12 disciples, they went out and they preached that men should repent and they cast out many devils. How could they do that? We know this because they had been given the power. Jesus gave them the power to do it or they couldn't have done it. So they did do it and they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. So notice that that healing anointing was also cooperating with them. 
So since Jesus gave them power over unclean spirits and they could cast out devils, why couldn't they out of this boy? The, verse tell, the next verse tells us why. Let's go back to Mark chapter 9 and verse 19. Remember what the father had said? He said, uh, I brought my son to your disciples and they could not cast, you know, cast out the devil. Verse 19, Jesus tells us why it didn't work in this situation. He answered the man and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. So he's letting us know why didn't the disciples get results? It was a faith issue because they had the power. So notice this, you can have the power but not be using your faith. And it won't work. Just having the power, you also have to use your faith. Amen. So it's faith and power together that bring results yeah. in the manifestation. So uh, we say this. Well, let, let me put it this way. If, you're, if you have a car, it's parked in your driveway, and that engine gives that car power to move to a different location, we would say it this way. The key is the faith. You have to put the key in and turn it on that activates the power. It's your faith that activates the power of God. If you don't ever put the key in that car and turn on the key, it doesn't matter that there's power in that vehicle to move you around from one location to the next. You're not going anywhere without you adding that key and igniting that engine, right? It's the same thing. Faith ignites the power of God. Amen. You have to apply your faith to the power of God. So it wasn't a power issue. It was a faith issue. So this is why he tells them, he's letting them know why they didn't get results. Oh, faithless generation. It's their faith issue. So who is, Je who is Jesus speaking to when he says, faithless generation is he talking to the man who has the the son that needs freedom or is he talking to his disciples he's talking to both the generation <laughs> both of them my disciples plus the man amen then he says how long shall i suffer you he's been training them but they back down and let slip what they have been trained in. You can be trained by the word. You can be trained by the spirit of God. You can be trained as you sit under your pastor, but that doesn't mean you're appropriately applying skill. And so it's not enough to be trained. You have to become skillful in what you're trained in. And so Jesus was a little bit, displeased with them when he said, how long shall I suffer you? He's been giving them demonstration all day long. They're seeing demonstrations of him with releasing his faith in the power of God and getting results. And they themselves had done that, but yet they lost their progress. Amen. Amen. So Jesus has been teaching. Jesus has been preaching. Jesus has been healing for a period of time, but he said that they're still a faithless generation. So it's not just enough to say you've heard it. You have to believe it. Yes. <laughs> Amen. So the disciples should have gotten results. For they did in the past, right? But they're not getting results here. So what do we see? Their faith regressed. They regressed in faith. Their faith was diminished. And faith is not something that's going to stay at one level. It's always going to be increasing or it's going to be diminishing. So always be feeding your faith so that your faith is always on the increase. So Jesus tells, tells this man, bring him to me. Meaning this, I'm not going to let you go away without your help. Amen. Jesus wants help for anyone who comes to him. So verse 20, so they brought the boy unto Jesus. And when the boy saw Jesus straightway, the spirit 
tear him. So now we know there's a spirit causing this boy's physical yeah. condition, that the boy is dumb. He cannot speak. So it's a spirit that's causing this. And the boy, the spirit tear the boy, the boy fell on the ground and he wallowed foaming. So when this devil in the boy got in Jesus's presence, that demon started manifesting yeah. in the, in the body of that boy. And the boy had something like what we would call a seizure. He's yeah. foaming mm -hmm. at the mouth. So, uh, I, just to, just to let you know what happens when uh, the anointing gets close to someone who is harassed by the enemy. The yes. devil knows that freedom is close. Yes. Help is close. Yes. Years ago, I would do um, tent crusades. I would go into inner cities. I would have food and clothes and toys. We would invite, invite people of the community to come to get the items, but they had to hear me preach first. After they, I would preach them a short message I would teach them how to be born again, how to be saved, and then I would give them the free food, clothes, and toys. So we had two separate tents, one I'd minister to them and then one that held the items. And then I would, after I preached, I would give the salvation call before we distributed any items. We would give the salvation call, and nearly every single person, we'd had hundreds that would come, and nearly every single person would come up to get born again. So then after that, we would say, is there anybody here who wants healing for their body? So I would have them to line up around the wall of the tent. And sometimes you'd have, you've had hundreds in a line. I didn't line them all up at once. I would take them one at a time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't let them sit down until they were healed. Why? Because healing belonged to them. Yes. And we came for them to get results, not to go back home sick. So I didn't let them sit down until they, till they were received their healing. And so I noticed, though, that some of the people were tormented by the devil. Some were harassed to some measure. Not saying they were all possessed. There were some that might have been possessed, but there were some that were just oppressed or depressed. There are they're different degrees that the devil can trouble someone. And so when they would get in the line, I would notice that the ushers, the men that would help, and they would bring up a person one at a time, that while the person, maybe, maybe they're, they're down the row, uh, uh, down the line about 10 people, they would just stand there in line. But when they get up to like being number four or number three or number two, and they were harassed by devil, they would start getting agitated and they would start acting out while in the line. So I began to pay attention to that. And then when it come their turn, they'd take off and run out of the tent. So I taught the ushers, you go chase them. <laughs> You bring them back. Why? They want help or they would have never gotten in the line. I'm not forcing help on someone who doesn't want it. They got in the line showing they wanted it. But what happened? The, the devil in them caused them to be so agitated getting close to the anointing that they would get so agitated they couldn't stand there and they would take off running. And so I trained the ushers. You go after them. So our ushers became good runners. <laughs> And they would chase them and they would bring them back and invariably they would get set free. You see, this is what's happening in this situation. When this boy is getting close to freedom, the devil in the boy didn't like it. And so he starts acting out to try to take control of the setting. To try to dominate that setting. You take authority. You don't let demons cause unrest. I'm talking to pastors or those ministering. You don't let them cause unrest. Those people want freedom. That's why they're there. You don't let the devil distract them and get attention. The devil's not, we're not, we don't give the devil attention. He, he's got one right. Shut up and come out. His, his right is not to take over the service, take over the attention. And that's what this devil was threatening to do by creating a scene through this boy. Amen. Amen. And so you have to learn that uh, the devil doesn't want to leave the place where he gets expression through. So in verse 21, Jesus asked the father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And the father said when he was a child. So it's, I, we don't know how old the boy is, but we know this. He's still under his father's care. 
Verse 22, the father goes on and tells the condition. Oftentimes, the devil has cast him into the fire and into the waters, look at this, to destroy him. So the devil has gotten the boy to attempt to commit suicide. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now, I want to again address what we see in verse 22. Oftentimes the devil has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. The devil's not happy till he's destroyed. Yeah. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy is what John 10.10 10 tells us. Yes. Satan comes but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, but I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Right. So anything that steals, kills, and destroys, God doesn't have anything to do with that. That's, right. That's always, always, always yeah. the devil. Amen. Everything bad is of the devil. Everything yeah. good is of God. Right. It's very simple. Yeah. Everything bad is of the devil. Everything good yeah. is of God. Yeah. Any, and it doesn't even matter. You say, well, I haven't been taught that way in my life. It doesn't matter how you've been taught. It matters what the Word says. Yeah. Yeah. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy anything that steals from your life. Anything that kills, whether it kills a marriage, kills a business, kills a body, anything that kills a home, it's from the devil. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, but I've come that you might have life. So in this verse 22, we see that this boy has been in a situation where he's tried to commit suicide. This devil in him has driven him to try to commit suicide. And I again want to say that if you know of, if there's been loved ones, family members, relatives, anybody that you may know of that's committed suicide, if they were born again, just because they committed suicide doesn't mean they went to hell. Because someone can be sick in their mind just like you can be sick in your body. There are Christians that get sick and die. They don't go to hell because their bodies got sick and they died. Well, even more, if someone's mind gets sick. Anyone that commits suicide, anyone that commits suicide, their mind is sick. The devil has t tormented and made their mind not work right because anyone in their right mind does not injure themselves. A sound mind does not injure self. And so just know this. I don't know what people have been taught. I don't know what they've been told or what they've heard. That if someone commits suicide, that they'll go to hell. Not if they're a Christian. Not if they're a Christian. Jesus is rich in mercy. God is rich in mercy. And I guarantee you, if they were born again, even though their mind got sick, they still went to heaven just because their mind broke down didn't mean they went to hell. Any more than their body breaking down means they went to hell. Amen. Amen. And so I want to know, I want people to know that because the devil has tormented many mamas and daddies and family members when somebody had when suicide has been involved. So here we know it's the devil that's working through this boy in verse 22 that tries to tries to take his life from him. And the father makes this statement. Now, can you imagine the desperation of what this does to a home? of this kind of behavior and these kinds of episodes, mm -hmm. how it torments and troubles a home. So the man, the father in this desperation in verse 22, the last phrase says, but if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Yeah. So you can understand the father's heart. Yeah. So the, the spirit's not just tormenting the boy, he's tormenting the whole family yeah. through this boy. Yeah. So when the father says, if thou canst, do anything. Now notice the father is unsure if Jesus can help. He's unsure if you can do anything. These words of the father are putting the responsibility back on Jesus. If you can do anything and Jesus verse 23 answered him and said, if you can believe all things are possible to him that believes. So we want us to see Jesus is letting the Father know it's not a matter of what I can do. It's a matter of what will you choose to believe. Amen. Amen. He's letting him know all things are possible. I can do this, but it's not just what I can do. What will you choose to believe? 
So look at these words. Jesus said, all things are possible to him that believeth. I love this phrase, all things are possible. To who? Not to everybody, but just to the ones that believe. As a Christian, as a believer, that's you. You're a believer. You would benefit yourself by saying, all things are possible for me. All things are possible. All things are possible. Build that into your spirit. Build that into your heart. Say it over and over when you're faced with an impossible situation. All things are possible to me because I believe. I believe. So all things are possible to believe. All things are possible to me. Now notice, believing is a choice, not a feeling of emotions. You don't believe because you feel like God heard you. You don't believe because you felt something in your body. Believing is a choice and strictly a choice. It's a decision you make. In verse 24, and straightway the father of the child cried out, and he said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Now, we see the sincerity of this dad, don't we? He's He's saying, I, I'm because at first he was putting the responsibility on Jesus. If you can do anything, do it. But now Jesus puts it back on him. You must believe. And so we see his sincerity. Lord, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. Can you believe, but also have unbelief at the same time? Because this is what the father is saying. I believe, help me with my unbelief. Well, let me explain it to you this way. You can have faith in your heart, but doubts in your head. And this is what the father was voicing. I believe in my heart, but my head, (laughs) my head is full of doubts. My head is full of wondering, how is this going to happen? You see, so as long as faith is in your heart, every Christian is going to find at times faith in their heart, but doubts that come to the mind. Amen. Now choose, you want to live out of your heart or your mind? It's not so much about getting rid of all the doubts. It's choosing to live out of your heart where the faith is. Because faith in your heart will still work with doubts in your mind if you'll just keep acting on the faith and not the doubts. Keep complying with the faith in you instead of the doubts in the mind. Amen. Amen. When you go to believe... God with your, when you go to believe God with a faith that's in your spirit, the devil will bombard the mind. He'll tell you all the reasons why you're not going to receive your answer, why you're not going to receive your help. Ignore that. Ignore all the thoughts that come to the mind. Answer them. Say, no, that's not true. God's word will come to pass. God's word will come to pass because there's faith in your heart and your heart wants to believe. Your faith, your heart does believe, but you, you turn and you decide I'm going to operate out of my heart and not out of the faith, the, the, the doubts, the thoughts that come against my mind. Yeah. So just because those thoughts of doubt, of doubt come doesn't mean you don't have faith. That's right. You do have faith and the faith that's in your heart will still work if you will turn toward your heart and away from the doubts that come to the mind. That's why 2 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bring bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So he's basically saying this, is that when those thoughts of doubt come, they come to all of us. Cast them down. Don't accept them. Don't take them in and let them dictate your actions. Let the faith in your heart dictate how you act. Amen. Amen. How do you cast those thoughts down? You answer them. No, that's not my thought. No, that's not my thought. And you say what the word says. My God shall supply. Jesus took my infirmities and he bare my sickness. You answer with what the word says. Again, faith is a choice, not a feeling. Yes. Choose to act on the faith that's in your heart instead of acting on the doubts that come against your mind. Amen. That's what the Bible calls fighting the good fight of faith. Yeah. Amen. Everyone is going to encounter that. Now choose. Choose to live out of your heart. That's what this father was referring to. He had faith in his heart. That's why he brought, he brought the boy to Jesus. He had faith that his son could be set free. But there were doubts coming against his mind. 
So notice, the faith in his heart still worked, even though there were doubts that were in his mind. Amen. Since faith was in the man's heart, Jesus could, Jesus could help him. There was faith there. There was faith there. If Jesus is to help us, he needs our faith. Amen. He needs us to believe that he can help us. Verse 25 says, When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead in so much that many said he is dead. So notice this, the devil coming out made one great last display. Sometimes after you minister, and I've known this through ministering over the years, is sometimes people look like they got worse after you ministered to them. What was that? That was the devil coming out. That was the sickness coming out. That was the pain coming out. Trying to make one last great display to deceive you into thinking it didn't work. So notice, when Jesus told him to come out, it looked like it got worse. Dad Hagen, who was our spiritual father, talked about many times he would minister to someone who had mental problems. And after several days, he'd minister to him and tell the devil to come out of him. Family would call and say, Brother Hagen, they've gotten worse. He said, what of it? That's just a sign that that devil's coming out. And he, and he said, invariably after three and sometimes up to ten days later, their mind would become instantly free. Why? Because he recognized the pattern. This is the pattern when the devil's dealt with. Sometimes he throws one last great demonstration. But it's a sign he's coming out. Verse 27, And Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast him out? And he said, This kind comes comes forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So this shows there's different kinds of evil spirits. He said, This kind comes out by prayer and fasting. But I want you to know this, prayer and fasting doesn't change God and it doesn't earn something from God. It will not earn someone's freedom. Fasting and prayer changes us. It makes us more sensitive to God and to the faith that's in our spirit. That's the benefit of prayer and fasting is it causes us to become more sensitive to the faith that's in our spirit. And if those disciples would have been sensitive to the faith in their spirit, they could have cast it out. But they had regressed in faith. Amen. So prayer and fasting doesn't earn something from God. It positions us to be sensitive to what God has put in us. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We trust you've enjoyed today's program. Visit us at DufresneMinistries.org to learn of our upcoming meetings, share your testimony, submit a prayer request, or visit our online store. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Dufresne Ministries.